stepping out of Babylon. Around the same time, she became she became um, <laughs> around the same time she became a member of the High Suisse and toured the world together with Bob Marley. In the late 80s, she hit the Billboard charts with Electric Boogie, which led to the dance craze Electric Slide. During the 1990s, she worked with Donovan Germain of Penthouse Records, where she bridged the gap between reggae and dancehall by collaborating with artists like Tony Rebel, Cathy Rex, and Bujo Bamaki. Now closing the cycle, Donovan Germain produced the new album, Timeless, a collection of her favorite Studio One songs. Despite the accolades Marcia Griffiths has achieved in her career that spans over 55 years, she has always treated music as well as her talent with utmost and has remained humble and approachable. Welcome once again, the Queen of Reggae, Marcia Griffiths. Um, I would like to put the first question to you, Marcia. Um, you started your career at Studio One as a teenage girl. Um, how did you become part of the record label and the famous studio? Did you have to go through those infamous auditions that were kept at Studio One? Well, greetings everyone. Uh, I'm happy that I never had to do an audition. I performed the first time with Barry on Easter Monday morning, 1964, and I was taken on the same day to Studio One, where I went straight in the studio. And I sang a song that was written by a friend of mine, but it's a duet. But of course he got nervous and I ended up with the song all by myself, which was never released. So when Mr. Dodd heard my voice, he was overwhelmed and he was seeking so hard to find a hit song for me. So he had me doing collaborations with people like uh, Bob Marley, Bob Andy, Tony Gregory, the late Priye. But it was not until 67, as you just mentioned, that I had my first hit song. But I never did an audition when I went there. Okay, so you mentioned Studio One, a legendary place in the history of Jamaican music. And you just spoke about some of the duets, the duets that you recorded there. So we want to play a little snippet of some of these tracks and see what you can remember about them specifically. So let's try a bit of track one. Um, and see what you can tell us about it. from Byron Lee and he's a great singer and even up until now he's doing you know still doing his thing but Tony Gregory was one of the, the male artists there that as I said we collab with and 
it was so nice working with Tony because he's a songwriter himself and he writes a lot of, because on the flip side of that song is a song that he himself wrote and played on, you know, and it was a hit song as well. Uh, so then give us a little taste of track two and let's see if this is what you're talking about. Okay, so how old were you when you recorded that, Marcia? I don't believe that that's me. This sounds like a <laughs> <laughs> chipmunk. <laughs> I was 12 years old when I did that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people talk about Studio One as a, 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 a training ground, but somewhere that was a, a, a harsh environment, a difficult place to get a start. What was it like for you at a tender age? Well, of course, it was male dominated. When I went there, the only woman I saw there as an artist was Sister Rita. But everyone else was, you know, all male. So I felt a little uncomfortable, but Bunny Whaler was the only one I knew then because we go way back from kindergarten days. So I was more or less confident because I knew, you know, what I was about and I was sure that I could do what I'm doing. So I never had any doubt in myself then. But when I say a family affair, anyone who is in the studio, of course in those days, the music and the voice goes down one time. Because a two track. You don't lay rhythm and then voice. It's just a two track, so everything goes on. Can't make any mistake, but whoever is recording, if Ken Booth is recording, people like myself and Bob and they would be doing the harmonies and vice versa, whoever, you know? Right. Bonnie Wheeler is voicing, Bob Andy and myself would do harmonies for him. So it was just like one big happy family. And of course, you know, we see it as Jamaica's Studio One. Yes, Jamaica's kind of Motown. Motown, that's what I mean, thank you. <laughs> Indeed. So I know my uh, fellow uh, chairs on the panel have a lot of questions they want to put to you, but sticking with the Studio One theme, just a few last tracks to give some reminders of. So, thinking of this family affair, give us a taste of track five and see what you can remember about this one.
Yes. And of course, the gentleman on the song was none other than... Bob Marley. So tell us about recording that track with Bob Marley. How did it come about and what was the experience like? Oh, that was so much fun, voicing that song because we had to voice together. And of course, in the beginning, you hear me say, Chaman, because, you know, as a little girl, I was very skinny. They called me toothpick. <laughs> so he was teasing me. And I said, Chaman, and Mr. Dodd left that on the tape, you know, as part of it. But it was, I enjoyed working together with Bob. Okay, and of course you had that long working relationship oh, yes, right the way yes, through. Yes, yes, okay, yes. so next track, give us a taste of track nine. Uh, this is uh, recorded with someone that there hasn't been that much information about, so I'm hoping you can enlighten us about doing this track and about the man you did it with. Yes. That was um, Jeff Dixon, who was later called Free Eye, but he was never known as a singer. Okay. He, Mr. as I said, Mr. Dodd was just trying all kind of things, you know. So Jeff came on, and um, he decided to do this collaboration with me. It was a popular song in Jamaica. And we just tried something, and believe it or not, it was a hit song in Jamaica. But as I said, he's no singer. He's a radio <laughs> announcer. OK. OK, so last track before I pass the baton back to uh, colleagues on the other side. Give us a bit of uh, track six, another long-lasting connection that's made at Studio One. Yes. Of course, that's none other than Bob Andy. Yes, so maybe you can enlighten the good people here about how did you uh, become, how did you begin working with Bob and, you know, Bob Andy and the whole connection and where did it lead? Bob Andy was a member of a popular group called the Paragons in Jamaica. I met him at a rehearsal one night, so my friend took me there and they were rehearsing and I said to them, I can sing, you know, but I wasn't, I never started singing yet when I met Bob Andy. So it was not until the Paragons came to Studio One and I was already there that they came in and say, hey, look who is here, Patti LaBelle, because I sang a Patti LaBelle song for them that night down the aisle. So he came in as a songwriter, Studio One, 
and um, Mr. Dodd had asked him to write a couple of songs because the song that we recorded there, Bob and Myself, that was a hit, was really together. And I can remember when Young Gifted and Black was on the British charts doing very well, Mr. Dodd was the only person who had another duet with me and Bob. So he quickly released that song as a follow. But Bob was really a strong, prolific songwriter in Studio One. So he wrote all the songs I recorded there as Studio One in that decade. Melody Life, Truly, Mark My Word, um, Tell Me Now. These songs are all written by Bob Andy. Okay. Yes. Including the duets. Okay. Oh. I would say he's one of the main Jamaican poets, Bob Andy, a, 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 a real poet. Yes, he is. Definitely. Definitely. Indeed. So, uh, colleagues, uh, if you'd like to, yeah, go forward. Yes. Um, the other day we had three young female reggae singers here on the panel, and we talked about what it's like for them to work in this male-dominated thing called reggae. You mentioned before briefly that it was kind of rough for you as a, as a young uh, lady at Studio One. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about what it was like to be among all those rude boys and... <laughs> <laughs> oh, what to be rude boys, I don't know, but... Just, well, um, it was rough in so many ways, being a woman, because you're young, vulnerable, and all eyes, you know, are directed on you. The good thing was that Bob Marley and Bonnie Whaler were two guys, or even Peter, that as a young girl, try your best that they don't see you walking offline because their eyes were always on you, watching you as a young girl. So it was good that I met Bob Andy in, in that time because we became, you know, friends. And because of that, he was like a father figure. You know, he went everywhere, he protected me. But I remember one night in particular, we went to perform with the Scatterlights in Clarendon. And of course, because they weren't able to do as they like as a young girl, and Bob Andy was there, we were left on the roadside because one of the musicians said that they are only responsible for singer, not singer and boyfriend. So I was left back in Clarendon as a young little girl to walk back to Kingston. And I mean, things like these would happen from time to time. And it was nothing like physical abuse, but we were abused as women in the business, male dominated. So thank God that Bob Andy was always there and he was more experienced, more knowledgeable of the music and everything. So God was looking out for me, even at that tender age, you know, to have him there. And uh, Marcia, what was it like then for you to work with a female producer compared to the male producers? Wow, it was a relief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you can describe what it was because no. you had this beautiful hit there, Stepping Out of Babylon. And what it Believe me, Pottinger I was, was in my comfort zone when I met Miss Pottinger. Because as another woman, she could understand, I could relate to her. It was Judy, Sister Judy and myself were recording with her, but we could speak with her and she would understand exactly what we are feeling as another woman, you know. And I was very comfortable. And once you're comfortable, you will give your best. So I was very relaxed, very comfortable. And that's how I got to beautiful albums, naturally, and step in. From, besides, she had um, one of the best engineers there, Errol Brown, mm -hmm. and we had a good rapport, we had a beautiful relationship, all of us, really, really nice. So out of that, you know, we had some good music, because of course, Miss Potina was the only female producer in the music at that time. 
Yeah, and I think unfortunately we don't have a lot yet, right? On the no, up until the now I'm not, I've never seen can, another one. Yes, that is true. And David, maybe you can play the song Stepping Out of Babylon? Yeah, you we can to go to track 37. Microphone, microphone, microphone. I just want to mention that that slide down bar on the drums. Check, check. Uh, Marcia, about uh, this period and this particularly, this particularly uh, tune, I know in the uprising tour in the 80, uh, in 1980, uh, you had the opportunity to have uh, a brief opening set for, for the Whalers, uh, delighting uh, Bob Marley's fun with this tune, like Earthing Inside, Stepping Out of Babylon. So you were singing solo before Bob Marley's show in, in Europe. Definitely, I was, I never ever relinquished my solo career at no time. If I'm a Bob and Marcia or an I3, I maintained my solo career all the time. And, and what was uh, your feeling singing solo in those big, big, big stadiums in, in the 1980? Well, I was not surprised of what was happening because I knew that every year or every day i try to rise above you know to 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 advance in whatever i'm doing and as we go along it was a big jump and a big difference from studio one to to stepping out of babylon because here we have sly dunbar but dunbar on drums and um few other musicians and when we did that particular song it was not a song written for me it was a rhythm that I loved and Miss Fortuna gave me the rhythm and I gave it to Bob Marley I gave it to Bob Andy and blues Philip James or the blues busters who discovered me quite a few songwriters I gave that rhythm because I loved the rhythm and no one ever come up with a song and I took the rhythm back and later you did recut it for Donovan German and you were the queen with four, four yeah. particular kings yeah. like if I, Buju Banton, Tony Rebel, Cobra and Beanie Man, and Beanie Man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah stepping out of Babylon 90s yeah. version yeah. yes yes and yeah I have a question about the connection with Sonia Potager because as you were mentioning you did these two tremendous albums with her in the late 70s but your connection actually goes back quite considerably earlier than that. So I'd like you to play a little snip of track 17 and see what you can remember about this and tell us about that early connection with her. Uh, 17. Yeah, so it's going back, uh, back and forward in time. Yeah, track 17.
Does it ring a bell? I totally forget about that song. <laughs> but did you work with Sonia Potter during the late 60s? Yeah, <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, that song was done by Bonnie Wheeler and myself. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So how did that early connection come about? How did you come to be recording for her at that time? Well, it was just a little once, one-off song, you know, before we got um, connected into going into doing albums. And of course, I've been hearing so much about Miss Potting, and I said, well, this is a lone female producer, so I decided to do this track with her. But it was really Bonnie Wheeler who came up with the idea, and both of us wrote that song together. Okay. <laughs> but I never remember anything about that song. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to shortly interrupt to acknowledge the presence of Prince Amaya Sal uh, Selassie, um, the grandson of Haile Selassie I and a president of the Crown Council of Ethiopia right here in the first row. Yes, please welcome. Wow. Um, back to Marcia. Um, I want to go back to the formation of the I3s. Um, if my research is correct, it wasn't really Bob Marley who, who formed the Harmony Group, no. but it was you, maybe you can tell us how that came about. I had three shows for a weekend in New Kingston in Jamaica, and for some unknown reason, Mr. Dodd invited Sister Judy and Sister Rita and myself separately to come into the studio to do some harmonies on a track he had in Studio One. We were shocked when we all met up, all three of us. So after we recorded the song, I mentioned to them, say, I'm performing for this weekend. Can you come and do some harmonies for me? And they said, oh, yes. So we had a very quick rehearsal with my songs, because they were all familiar with the songs I was performing. And at the end of the performance, the third night, we decided to do some, a jam, all three of us. And Sweet Inspirations was very popular in Jamaica. So we were singing some Sweet Inspirations songs and the audience loved it. And they said, why don't you girls form a group? So as you know, we said, why not? So we decided, I said, let's call ourselves I3. And Sister Rita said, I3. So I said, yes, it's like saying we three, but instead of saying we three, we say I3. Bonnie Whaler was present when we were deciding about the name, and he said, yes, it's the I. So we settled for that name. But what was strange was that Bob Marley, Peter Touch, and Bonnie, at that same time, they were having some fallout. So immediately, he heard that we formed a group, and he called us in to do Natty Dread. That was the first song. We went in and we did Natty Dread, straight to number one, and then after His Majesty's passing, he called us in to do Jalib. We went in and we did Jalib, and the rest is history. And that's the reason why I say coming together as I3 with Bob Marley was never a mystic. It was ordained by the Almighty God. Because it was just strange that at that time when the group was formed, that's the time when Bob had the follow with his brothers. So we just went right in that slot. And we became his three little birds, you know? Yes. <laughs> Hello? Okay. <laughs> Marcia, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about uh, what was so special about working with Bob. You know, he, he was a very, very special and spiritual person. And I, I guess you can tell the nice audience at Rotterdam a few stories about Well, the it. first thing I'll say is that Bob 
is the one who opened my eyes to realize that being a singer or being a person who has the opportunity to communicate to the world, to the four corners of the world, through the medium of the music. He opened my eyes when I realized that the music was not just entertainment. It went much deeper. It's a responsibility we have. When you can communicate to people, this is the greatest opportunity that you can teach, educate, uplift through the music because you can send messages to teach and to educate and this is the only way that we can unite the world and this is the reason why the music the message in the music is so important because we use that music to send the right message as the child is born they can they know the song immediately they can move to the beat from you reach two, I just saw, yesterday I saw someone send me a WhatsApp with a two-year-old singing Bob Marley's song, two years old. So it's important that we, as singers and players, send the right message. And I can tell you that when I worked with Bob the first time and I saw how serious this man took his music, that was when I realized that this is a serious business. It's not just entertainment. And from then on, I started thinking about my utterance in my music. And I am happy that I can tell you that I gave Bob flowers while he was alive. He didn't have to pass for me to know that this man was special. He did everything different from the norm. He spoke different. He did everything different. He was so unique, and I realized that this man was truly sent by the Almighty God because I've never seen anyone take the music as serious as Bob did. The music was his life. Whatever else he did as a person in his personal life, his music was everything. Nothing came before his music. No money, nothing at all. Because he said it, if money come, money come. But he was never in it for money. And I guess maybe that's why it turned out that he might be one of the richest men in the music business. He wasn't there for the money. So working with Bob was truly a blessing because I know, I knew it then that this man was really special. He was chosen to do the work he came to do. And I thank God that I was part of that experience. You know, and I want to say that the music is one of the most powerful weapons that we have today. No other weapon is as powerful as the music. We cannot live without music and food. These are the only two things that we cannot live without. Because it's our soul, it's our life. Music is life. So I am truly thankful that I was a part of that experience, the Bob Marley experience. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you mentioned that before, Marcia, that you always had a solo career at the same time, you know, which is uh, unusual which is very unusual because normally the people, you know, especially being with Bob Marley and the Whalers in the ice tree. So how did you handle this? You know, maybe you can tell us a bit because Bob and you, you toured the world and still the solo career. Yes, it wasn't difficult for me to be a, to maintain my solo career and being on the road with Bob because I, at the time I was recording with Miss Pottinger, so I would do like a set of music, and while that is released and going, I'm on the road with Bob, you know, because in the first part, we were given the opportunity to open the shows for Bob. So we went out and did like a song each, and we came together and do a song so it was, we were still promoting ourselves as solo artists, you know, Judy, Rita, and myself. 
So it was really difficult for me maintaining my solo career. And um, later on in your career, you had this song, Electric Boogie. Maybe you can tell us the story behind it, because sometimes it is confused, and the, the song is uh, acknowledged to Bunny Whaler solely, but which is not true. <laughs> You told me recently, maybe you can enlighten the people about the song. Yeah, there are so many misunderstanding and misleading things that needs to be corrected. This song was done originally by myself. And maybe I could tell you the story quickly. As again, in a male-dominated business, women are just seen maybe for their favors. So it was a performance that I three did in Toronto, all three ladies, and of course, we were not paid. Each of us got 700 Canadian dollars. Out of that 700 dollars, I had my 700 dollars that I walked downtown and I saw a rhythm box. I fell in love with the rhythm box. It was like a keyboard. It had every beat, every sound, a Hawaiian, bossa nova, cha-cha, everything. And there was a particular sound, keyboard, called the repeater. I just love that rhythm box. I took it home, and of course, Bonnie and I go way back. He came to my house, and I showed him this rhythm box, and I said, Bonnie, listen to these sounds. <laughs> he fell in love with that sound immediately. He recorded the repeater sound on the piano with the beat, poof. He <laughs> took it back to Portland where he lived at the time, came back the following day with that song. We never sit on it, it was so spontaneous. Everything was just happening. We went in the studio, we called in Sly and Robbie, and they laid on top of the, what we had recorded previously, and every single keyboard sound that you hear in that song, maybe about 10 different styles, is from that rhythm box. So out of evil, commit good. Because I was, I was not paid, but out of my little $700, I ended up with a, a hit song. <laughs> so this song was released in 1983, done by me, produced by Bonnie Wheeler. It was a song that was always in the charts went to number one. It was big in the Bahamas, Amsterdam. Chris Blackwell said to me one day, you know what is selling and I'm not even promoting it? Electric Boogie. Because he wanted the album from Bunny and Bunny refused to give him the album. So, while it was just there going off its own strength, in 1989, I was on Sunsplash tour. While we were on the West Coast, we got a call from Dr. Dredd, and he said, hey, you know what's going on down in Washington, D.C.? Electric Boogie's the biggest thing, and they put this dance to this song. By the time we, the tour reached to Washington, D.C., I had to learn that dance. <laughs> I was forced to learn the dance and perform the song, and remember, this song is not on my program at all i had to perform the song and learn the dance and do it because the whole audience was doing this it was like summertime and anyone from any other state that was visiting they took a copy back to their hometown and the song and the dance just spread like wildfire in the 50 odd states so I couldn't believe it myself because I've never seen anything like this. So we kept searching everywhere for Bonnie because we said we have to do this video. Have to find Bonnie because this was just the biggest shock for me that this song is so huge. Before I knew it, I was on BET, MTV, CBS doing interviews about this song because it was so big. But I couldn't find Bonnie. So I said, I don't know what's going to happen. So we went to Jamaica and of course Copeland was helping me to find Bonnie because we were on tour together and then when I went to Jamaica to my surprise we were driving one day um, no we were going down 
No, not in Jamaica. And I saw Bunny's car, and I said, "Here is here is Jabby." When I went inside, Jabby was very well inside. He was recording the video because he had already heard that the song was a hit. I was so shocked and yet so disappointed because I'm looking for him though that we can both do the video and you know for the song but he just wanted to capitalize on how big the song is and he's a writer so he recorded the song and he was now doing the video with his dancers and everything learn the dance and all that and believe me we took his version and everywhere I went it was we gave it to everyone we promoted it, but it was just mine that, mm. you know, that, that they loved. So we just started doing shows after shows, television. You know, this song was so big, it was like everywhere. There's no cruise, no wedding, no party that this song is not played. And up until this day, it is classified as the longest living song and dance. It has outlived the Bossa Nova, the Cha Cha, the Madison, the Busta, the Macarena, wow. everything. Wow. <laughs> wow. Do we want to play a little bit of it to remind ourselves about this monumental track which was a bit of a new direction for you so that would be track 41 my selector if you can drift down to the bottom end of the platform there because it was quite a departure for you in your career and you sort of You can, you can improvise on the moves. I just saw Copeland improvising on the steps because you know you can take it where you want as long as you're in time to come back. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I think we've reached the time when we're going to move to question and answer. This is the moment when you, the good people here, can put your special your question to our special guest, Marcia Griffiths. We've got an extra incentive this evening because. Marcia's manager, Copeland Forbes, the gentleman you just saw doing the electric slide with her, has been kind enough to bring some limited stock of her new CD. So anyone asking an intelligent and reasonable question may be permitted <laughs> to leave home with one. So who would like to put the first question? Okay, I think we've got a question over here. Question over here. Good afternoon, I'm really honoured to have her on this platform with you. Um, the tune Feel Like Jumping came out before I was born and um, being in a 
living in the UK, born in the UK, music was really accessible um, due to England, you know, being the mother country of um, Jamaica. Apologies. Um, but when we were at school, the get out clause to get out of um, a lesson that was um, boring or a teacher that was, you know, not so compassionate, I would look at my friend and glance at each other and we'd say, be like jumping. <laughs> and we would do anything malicious to get out of the lesson and that was our code. Wow. But the question that I wanted to ask you was, at the time, you talk about a lot of emotions, you talk about feel like jumping, feel like moving, feel like shouting, feel like crying. But what was your inspiration for that tune, given as well that Jamaica had not long achieved independence? That was just a happy song written by Bob Andy and Jackie Me Too. It was nothing of any, you know, depth. It was just a happy song, fun song, really, you know. You know, because the rhythm is bouncing and it's up. So, you know, the, the lyrics is just feel like dancing, feel like crying, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Keep the fire burning. <laughs> Master. Hi, I'm from London, England as well, born and raised in London, England. Oh. Same as the next history over there. What I wanted to know is what made you want you to do a tune called Peaceful Woman? Because I remember that as um, a small <laughs> child growing up in London, England. What was the inspiration behind that tune for you? I can tell you that that song is written by Jackie Edwards. He was a close friend of mine. Maybe you, you weren't born when Jackie was, you know, really raging in England with hit songs. But Jackie was a friend of mine, and because he knew me so well, and he saw my personality and my way of life, and he saw things that I was going through, experiencing at the time, he just penned that song, and I sang it from my heart sounded like that as well yes and i still play that as a dj in england still doing what wow I do thank music. you so, okay, so thank you very much a lot of the ladies love yeah. that song yeah. Yeah, yeah uh hello marcia my name, hi my name is vladimir uh, i'm from russia uh thank you for your music uh I just love the last album with uh, all the greatest hits, especially uh, Declarations of Right. There is a good wow. production on it. Oh, wow. But my question is about uh, the old times. Uh, uh, being a duo and R&B uh, lover uh, by myself, I want to ask you, uh, how, how did you uh, get to know uh, in your early years all this uh, new American music, like R&B and duo, uh, all this kind of music. How did you get to know to it? In Jamaica, then, we were influenced by American music. American music was played in our country, our little island, more than our music. So because of being influenced by American music, because my influence then was Aretha Franklin, Carla Thomas, Dionne Warwick, and Patti LaBelle. You know, that's all we hear every day, you know, American music. But we used to use those songs to re-record, to do our version of all these American songs. Mr. Dodd would go to America then, and he would bring back Curtis Mayfield and the impressions for the Whalers, because as three boys, three guys, he would bring group, albums and he would bring group for sister rita and the soulettes and he would bring solo songs for me and we would cover these songs that if we like a song from it so we were exposed already exposed to american music and that's all we use to cover the songs you know thank you Marcia. I'm from Birmingham, England. Gre greetings. Um, I just wanted to ask, is there anyone that you would have liked to collaborate with that you haven't collaborated with? Well, yes.
plans are in the making to do a collaboration with Patti LaBelle, who was my favorite singer. for that question because most definitely I know that if Bob was still around the music would not have been like this because this is a serious time this is a different time this is a different generation this is what the Bible calls a generation of vipers and this is a reason why we have to continue to teach to educate and we continue, it's just a few of us in this business that is left that are really trying to hold it together because it's all about the hype and maybe the money and the limelight and everything else because the younger generation is just a few that is thinking about message in the music. They are not concerned about that, but the Bible says God calls upon the singers and the players of instrument because this is the greatest thing we have to unite the world, as I said earlier. So we have to guide this generation and continue to show them and teach them that this is not about hype or money or whatever. This is about sending message as musicians and people who are chosen by God to do this work. So it's a hard work and we will continue to try and you know, teach the young generation. And I am happy that I could have inspired so many young ladies who are in the business today. And I am happy also that most of the ladies in the business, they are doing, they are sending message. Queen Africa. This is a strong sister that I love because she's a voice of the people. People like, people like Itana. Look at this young little girl, Coffee. Coffee is on a positive road, sending good message. So, you know, there's hope. There's hope, but I know for sure that if Bob was here, the music would not have taken. I don't know if you all remember when Bob passed. There was this great vacuum in the business. Yeah. It was just like a lull. Nobody knew where the music, the, what turn we were going to make. It was just there, sitting. And out of nowhere came this hardcore dance hall with some negative lyrics disrespecting women and all kind of things. But. This is when I decided, this, I was at Penthouse Records and I decided, I said to Jermaine, Jermaine, with all that's happening now since Bob has passed and this hardcore thing with all these young people coming in and they're sending some not so good message, I said to Jermaine, you know what, we could try using the hardcore dance hall rhythms with beautiful melodies and good lyrics and that's when I the whole 90s the decade of the 90s 
I had a string of songs on the penthouse label. Fire burning, nanny goat, all those songs I shall sing. And these are all dance hall rhythm, but it depends on what you do and what you put on these rhythms. So people like myself, Freddie McGregor, and all the rest of the female that I have inspired, we will just continue to keep on the right path because if you're not, if you are given the opportunity to communicate to the world and you're not doing it in a positive way, you're just gonna fall by the wayside. And I'll take the opportunity to say right now, that's one of the reasons why I love and respect Buju Banton because as a young, as a young artist, I met him when he was 17 years old, when he came to Penthouse. And when I listened to a couple of his lyrics, I never endorsed it. And I said to him, you know, we should be careful of our utterance because they'll come back to haunt us eventually. And we will just fall by the wayside if we are not making positive contribution. And he listened. He never forget what I told him. And every time he talks about me or he introduces me on stage, he refers back to what I said to him. And he made a turn, and he's here, you know. He is not one of the disposable, he was not one of the disposable DJs, you know, because if you're not making positive contribution in the music, trust me, because this is all about the work from the Almighty God. God calls upon singers and players. So it's, music is purity, music is life. So if you're not coming good, then, you know. Thank you. It's a question at the back. It's a question at the back. Oh, somebody's got it? Okay. Great. <clears throat> Greetings. 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 From South Korea, it takes two years to come in Roto Thompson's place. Uh, and I take uh, 22 hours about the flight. Wow! And, and I'm a representative of our country's small underground magazine and our jerk chicken restaurant, Chayong Boat. <laughs> and all of Korean reggae musicians. And my big question is for only for us because it can be our individual questions. Our country and Asia is different language. So it's really hard to get a reggae music, not just a vibe. Uh, I love uh, rebel, rebel music. I, I love every kind of reggae music, but our country, our, our Asia country, is hard to get a translation about the whole language about Jamaica batteries and English even hard. Uh, so people in Korea, uh, some musicians really want to uh, make a great reggae music, but mostly they are a invade about some kind of money music, like a big company to using reggae music for a bigger money. So I, I need a, I, I, I have a question and a big advice to uh, people, how to get a Asia or Korea people to get a re reggae music for the, the real, the, the natural way to get and it's gonna be very 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 uh, spread out when I when I went back to Korea and I and I and I said I met Marsha Griffiths and she advised to people reggae music is blah blah and uh, it's not about the money it's not about the fight so, yeah we love peace and I believe still small countries in Asia we really really love reggae and and I still have a super fast hard heart breaking and so, to sing. Okay, thank you. And, 
Yeah. If I can, if I can, I, I, I get a Korean national flag to here and to please sign about Marshall Griffith's sign or our Korean national flag and please gave us about the uh, advice to get a reggae music. Yeah. I am ready to come to your country. I am ready. Oh. No, please, my brother. Oh, gosh, he's crying. Oh. So, okay. Okay, thank you for your question. Just, 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 just ask Kim Jong Kong to look about my visa. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, we've got time for just one last question. So, uh, yeah, go one ahead. Two, and one, two. Greetings, greetings, Auntie Marcia. Thank you. Greetings, very much. greetings, my brother. Right. Um, oh. I had a question to ask, but you kind of answered the question throughout the other questions okay. that I did ask. But in saying that, I can still find one question to ask, as I am the last person to ask the question. So first and foremost, thank you for how many years of music, inspirational music that has traveled across the world. All people that don't even know, have a gramophone or anything like that, know about Bob Marley and the Whalers, know about um, Master Griffith. So we thank you for all of your inspirational music and the input and the desire oh. over all these years. Right. So my, I'll get to my question. I, I'm from an organization called Black History Studies and our main ethos is educating the community to educate themselves. Because of um, my organization, I managed to get a slot on a radio show, Colorful Radio in London, and basically my, my show is called The Message in the Music Show. All so right. I don't play anything other than inspirational music. And I must say, um, it's once a week, 10 till midnight. I'm not plugging it, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> once a week, 10 till midnight, every Monday, and at least three times a month, your tunes are played. Wow. Yeah, so I play showcases of your tune because we can do that. Because any tune, I could just go master with it. And it's the message in the music. Wow. Right? So you, you mentioned artists like Coffee, you mentioned artists like Itana, who was on my show as well. And Queen. Queen. I Freak her. Queen I Freak her. I'm definitely going to speak to her if I have to yeah. stop her. I'm Tanya to Stevens, all these sisters, right. you know? Janine. Janine. Janine yeah. is my beautiful sister yeah. as well. Yeah. So the problem that we have in the UK, right, is the commercial stations usually play the commercial reggae, which isn't usually inspirational with the message. So I'm always giving out my um, opinion on what we should do to get the message in the music played more commercially. But my opinion stands alone. So if I could have a, an opinion from an ambassador and queen and pioneer of reggae music to send back to the people, it, my opinions then would stand on your shoulders. Does that make sense? So could you give some um, advice to the people, uh, just not in the UK, but around the world, what we should do in, uh, in order to demand that 
inspirational message in the music gets played widely? Well, we have our children and we have to think about this generation. Because as I said earlier, from the baby is born and they hear the music, they start moving to the rhythm because it's, a, it's your soul. You know, no doctor in the universe can touch anyone's soul, but music does. And it touches the baby's soul. And I usually say they should put the lessons in the schools through music because the children just catch on so fast to the music, whether it's good or it's bad. So why not teach them something that is good to, to, to make a better world? You know, music is a universal language. When I saw Bob before 10, 100,000 people in Sweden, few of them could understand the English, but they know, they felt that positive vibration, and they know that the message is real and is positive. So it is so important for us to continue to send the right message. I remember Nelson Mandela in prison. It was the music that helped to release is freedom out of prison. Everyone started singing songs towards Nelson Mandela's release from prison. The music is just powerful. So we have some, a weapon as strong as the music. We should just use it to the best of our ability to make a better world, to teach this generation because they are the people of tomorrow. So I am thankful. I'm going to put this little one in fast that I am thankful that I could manage to cut across age barrier and I can still be here with this generation and especially with the album that I have now. It's an opportunity for the younger generation to know where the music is coming from because there's no building or nothing that is of value that can stand on any foundation that is not solid. So the foundation of the music is from the stables of the studio one. So this is an opportunity for this generation and this, you know, to learn and to know where the music is coming from because all these songs, Declaration of Rights, I mean, even a song like that, even then in the 60s, these guys were singing about consciousness, truth, and reality. They were the voice of the people from then. So. This is something that we are just continuing to do. This is a legacy we have, but if we are going to do it in any negative way, it will never last, and the world, united we stand, divided we fall. So we have to come together in unity, in a oneness, to send the right message to the four corners of the earth, just like Bob Marley took the music to the four corners, and we want to continue we are missionaries from a mis on a mission from God. We don't want it any other way. We'll have it no other way. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I just say, family, that answer makes me feel like jumping. <laughs> and mark my word, I will keep the fire burning. Oh, wow. Uh, now, thanks to each I and every... I love it, I love it, I love it. <laughs> Thanks to each and every one for their contributions to this very moving and emotive session. Uh, a date for your diary, just some advance warning that on Wednesday, the 21st of August, at 5.30 p.m., we are going to be chairing a very special session here at the Reggae University entitled Ethiopia and Rastafari to the World. We will be looking at the importance of Ethiopia to the cultural and spiritual heritage of the world. And we are very privileged to have with us at that session the presence of Prince Emias Salisalasi, as well as Ross Julio and Ross Ibe of the House of Rastafari. I encourage you all to attend that session. It promises to be very enlightening. Also, tomorrow, right here, 5.30 p.m., we've got, we've got a doubleheader tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Here Come the Kings with Morgan Heritage, followed by at 7 p.m., Strong like Samson, looking at the long and varied career of Linval Thompson. But right about now, one more time, a round of applause for the queen of reggae, Marcia Griffiths. Please, please make sure you don't miss the performance tonight at 11.30 on the main stage. <laughs>